This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast, starting off pretty mundane, but inevitably evolving into something psychedelic, a bit disturbing. Today we're discussing the films of Hayao, tell me how to say this, Hayao? Miyazaki. I know, but what's his first name? Is it Hayao? Just say Miyazaki, just say his last name. <laughs> Today we're discussing the films of Miyazaki created by his studio go. Ghibli in light of the new film, The Boy and the Huron. This is Mark Lintzenmeyer, feeling a little icky from my recent trip on The Cat Bus. Mm. This is Al Baker coming out of retirement for the 89th time in a futile quest for perfection and beauty. <laughs> this is Sarah Lynn Bruck, and uh, strangely, I'm feeling a little bit scared of parakeets. I don't know why. This is Lawrence Ware coming from Oklahoma City, and I'm on a, on a journey because my town was attacked by a hideous demon. Wow. So they say that these films are autobiographical. So uh, I, it's like those Godzilla films that are about nuclear, about getting bombed in World War II. I mean, one thing, one thing I love about Japanese movies, because it, especially in podcasts like these, you spend a lot of time thinking about the degree to which the movie you're watching is an allegory. But with Japanese movies, there's just never a question. Everything is always an allegory for something, and that's quite a liberating experience. Wow. So let's go around. What is your history? With Miyazaki here, what is how central has this been in your entertainment world? I'll start. I, I can say that I did not grow up with these movies. So I didn't start watching these until I became a mom. And I can't actually watch them without that perspective. Even watching these movies recently, my daughter was home from college and she really wanted to sit down and rewatch a lot of these with me once again. And that was really fun, but I cannot separate my mom self from my film watching self when I see these movies, which is kind of nice. That's really interesting. My first exposure to Miyazaki was in university when Spirited Away came out, I think while mm. I was at university or just before, and it mm -hmm. became a kind of totemic movie for people. It was the cool movie to know about and to have seen. And it was also just stunning. So that was my first... That was my first Miyazaki film, and I've watched loads since, but I didn't grow up with him as a child. And to me, he's like a college discovery filmmaker, so I see him as like a visionary. And like I, I'm always impressed by how like clever and beautiful his movies are, even though I know they have a lot of heart. But the thing that always attracted me to him was how thoughtful the movies seem to be, especially when you're in college, in contrast with... Disney, but rewatching a lot of Miyazaki films recently, I kind of thought there's some interesting ways that he's similar with Disney movies. Okay. So I first learned of Miyazaki when I was working at a now defunct store called Blockbuster Video. When I was in college, <laughs> tell us I more. Worked... <laughs> what is this strange place in which you speak? <laughs> I worked at this Blockbuster Video. I worked at many of them, like, like they would send us from store to store anyway. So I was in college and that's the way I worked my way through college is I worked at Blockbuster Video and working at Blockbuster Video. I had an interest in movies before that, but Blockbuster had this thing where they would let the people who worked there watch the movies before the movies actually came out so that we could like be knowledgeable about the movie to recommend and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, so I watched a lot of movies while I was in college for, because I was working at Blockbuster Video. And one time, I don't know why I picked this movie up, but I picked up this movie called Princess Mononoke. And it was really kind of influential for me. It really kind of opened my eyes because before that, my only experience to Japanese cinema was like Godzilla or something like that. I didn't really know much about animation and the unique styles of animation in, J in Japan. That film opened my eyes to that. And then from that, I began looking at things like Spirited Away, Kiki's Delivery Service, those kinds of things. And then when Howl's Moving Castle came out, it really kind of confirmed for me that this guy was really special, really interesting, doing some special things with filmmaking and animation. And so that was my introduction to him, was just like working as a lowly blockbuster video employee, getting these movies for free, watching them. And people would come over to my room, my dorm room, and watch them because I get the movies earlier. But he was like, oh, it's cool. Go watch these movies for free. They didn't respond well to that movie, mm. but it really impacted me deeply. And then it go, I go on and learn that it's, he's an important filmmaker. So yeah, that's my introduction to him. 
But I have really grown to appreciate his artistry in the years following that. Yeah, I don't even remember who cued me into Spirited Away, but I liked it enough that I sort of was looking forward to his next thing. Howl's Moving Castle came out that got a lot of press of how interesting it was. And so Mm -hmm. I eventually saw that and kind of have tried to keep up with him, but I never went back in time. So I'd seen Ponyo with my kids. I'd seen Spirited Away. I'd seen Arietti. I didn't realize that he was only the writer and not the director of that, the borrower's version. I hadn't seen The Wind Also Rises. So at some point, I kind of decided that I didn't actually enjoy watching them that much. Oh and so I was not oh, going to watch them on my own time. And mm-hmm. so I've never, if my kids expressed interest in my neighbor Torturo or whatever, like it's not, not like they were pushing me to watch it with them at home, but I was just like, that's something maybe they do with their friends somewhere else. They've discovered that kind of stuff at college. It, it took a little hassling myself to like actually get myself to watch a bunch of these movies. And I wasn't going to rewatch anything, but I did rewatch part of Spirited Away. I just didn't get to the whole thing, but I did freshly watch uh, Princess Mononoke. I'd never seen uh, The Wind Rises, Kiki's Delivery Service, and Torturo, plus the new movie, of course. I feel like I get it now. I started Nausicaa, and again, it's if I'd had a few more days, maybe I would have finished it, but like, I did feel like, okay, I get the point. So I guess I, I still don't love, love them. Like they all seem interminable to me. I really have a hard time watching one of them without falling asleep multiple times. I was doing this with my daughter. Wow. Oh my goodness. I get that. Yeah. They're so relaxing. Why do you think that is? I mean, the pacing is definitely, yeah, they're very relaxing. It's all very dreamlike. Mm -hmm. And I often find, like, I don't know whether this is a feature or a bug. I often find the plots hard to follow and non-linear. Let's say that. Yeah, non is are. a good word they for are. it. They are. But that kind of, it kind of makes sense because the, the, the films are, yeah, they're, they're about, the, so much of it is about creating an atmosphere and it's like a, an right. atmospheric exploration of a lot of different themes a lot of the time. So yeah, me too. I also fall asleep sometimes. You know what? I just watched a short documentary on Miyazaki and he addresses that point. I quoted it. <laughs> he said that his movies, It's not about story. He said, if you're going to create a masterpiece, he said, one shot will tell you whether it's a great film or not. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting because he doesn't write his stories out. He storyboards them and he sees Mm. everything visually like that. A linear type of story, we're not actually, I think, supposed to really fully understand it, or at least from my experience, I never fully understand what it is he's trying to say. But the visuals themselves are supposed to speak to what the story is about or speak to whatever it is that he's trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. If you're asking, like, what is this Miyazaki film about? The answer is never going to be a detail of the plot. It's going to be no. like, right. like, what's Ponyo about? It's about, I don't know, what even is Ponyo about? That was a bad example. Little Mermaid. <laughs> yeah, it's but like what spirited away about well this this journey but it's about feeling lost and alone and like being comfortable with yourself in a strange place that idea of you should be able to tell from one shot that it's supposed to be mm. beautiful and mm. i do find parts of it the introduction of the huron in the new, mo- new movie is you know presented mm-hmm. this way and this is why there's always sort of a, a a long slow very mundane establishing of like this is how kids get ready for school and they make their lunches and they walk down the street and here's, mm-hmm. and there's some very nice Kiki's delivery service. I was sort of watching the opening thing and it was set up as this beautiful house with a really nice garden. How hard it would be in reality to make a garden like that. Well, somebody had to draw all those. And paint. Yes. So it is, but at the same time, it is still, it's like classic Disney in that it's not super detailed. Like I admire the fact that it's all hand drawn and that's, but it's not like when you're looking at, your favorite 20th century or 17th century, whatever, painter, and you're like, wow, the very pixel by pixel, the beauty of this and the shadows, like, there are inherent limitations of simplicity built into it. Like, does that for you affect Mm. whether it is beautiful in its, I want to make the distinction between the form and the matter, right? That you can have beautiful shapes, but like the actual textures of the paint on the canvas of the sound of the instruments, that it's about the the matter, the texture. And I feel like there are inherent limitations in this that I don't necessarily sit there 
with my jaw open about the beauty of it in a way that I am with plenty of other films now that come out with sumptuous visual feasts. So I think what one of the things that makes Miyazaki a great artist is that the kind of limitations that you're talking about contribute to the kinds of work that he's trying to make. So like the th- among the themes that he explores in his films are like a yearning for sim- simplicity and simple kinds of beauty and like there's all the kind of dreamlike moments through all of these things. All of those kinds of themes, the kinds of things he wants to talk about, the kinds of movies he wants to make are all enhanced by having the limitations of hand-drawn animation or like they give him... There's a reason Miyazaki is a, an animator and not a live action filmmaker and not a playwright. And like he also works in manga, but that's because again, it's the, the forms that he chooses to work in contribute to the artistic vision that he wants to realize. So for me, the fact that it's not detailed is part of the point, right? Like the fact that punk music is out of tune is also part of the point. It's like the, the, lim- the limitations I think is important to the stuff that he's making that he is limited in that way. But I wonder, I heard someone talk about, maybe it was on another podcast or something, but talk about how, like when a character cries, it's not just tears running there in their face. It's their face almost like seems to explode with tears. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. and his images just sort of evoke, I think for him, an emotional response at that that we're supposed to connect to, that we're supposed to connect emotionally to what he's putting up on the screen. But even though we may not understand every single thing that's happening in the story or why. So I feel like it's more like he's creating, again, like a mood or something mm. or a vibe, even though that sounds so incomplete. But it, it that becomes more important, really, than some sort of a story because I never know. I can never guess where these stories are going. Or even like we watched Porco Rosso, which I think he hated that movie, I think, but, but we kind of loved it. And it was like, it's this pilot who has a head of a pig. And the point of the movie wasn't for him. He had a curse. So now he has a pig head. <laughs> and the point of the movie wasn't that he figure out a way to go back to his human self. That wasn't it. It was, he was just a guy who was cursed and now he has a pig head and you all just kind of get over that. And he happens to be a great pilot and a hero and an anti-fascist. And I was like, great. That for me, I'm totally on board because I don't know where his stuff is going ever. Okay. So Mark, I'm sensing a deep suspicion a deep hesitation, a deep criticism of Mizuyaki in your words. Here's the thing. The animation is definitely a choice for Miyazaki, right? He's making that choice for the films to look the way that they do. He could, if he wanted to, make a film, probably not like Across the Spider-Verse, but like make a film like Despicable Me or whatever, like that kind of animation style where it's very sharp, it's very clear, it's very, but he's making an artistic choice to make the films look the way that they do. And him making that choice, he conveys the emotions that he wants the viewers to have. Now, his stories for me have always been very light on plot, like the plot have never been the point of his movies. There is a plot, it's a light one, but there is a plot in all his movies, but that's never been the point. The point has always been the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere he creates, the magical realism that he kind of indulges. He he reminds me a great deal. Oh, Sarah, who's the guy who wrote 100 Years of Solitude? Love the time of cholera. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Exactly. He reminds me of him. He, He makes the animated film that's in that kind of mold. It has magical realism. There is a plot, but the plot's not the point necessarily. No. And all the stuff, the accoutrement, if you will, around the plot. It's the way the film makes you feel, not on a surface level even, but on a deeper level. That's mm-hmm. the point of the film. And I think that's why, like, this, these films with kids, if they did not have that deeper meaning, the kids wouldn't stick with them because the kids would be bored by them. But there's something going on that's below the conscious level that really appeals to kids and to us as we watch the films. 
So, I mean, I hear what you're saying, Mark, but I, I, I kind of think that his animation style, what he's up to is the whole point. Like he's trying to create a world and an atmosphere, a tapestry of life for us to live within and to criticize the plot or, say, or the animation style. And, you know, I mean, that's not the point. Like he's trying to do something else. And that's, I think, why he is such a great filmmaker. Yeah, I'm trying to just get a, a handle on how my appreciation for these films relates to just my appreciation or lack thereof for anime in general. That if these seem that, weird that's to That's a us, different thing. That's a different thing. But that's part of because as somebody who's a, newer to anime than you are, I've mm-hmm. watched other anime. It's not like this is the only thing, but this is like a really great example of it the is. genre. And, and I can picture people, and maybe I was one of these people that like, Oh, I look forward to the new Miyazaki movie, but in general, not ready to jump on board with anime. I've made progress in that area, but you know w- what we were just saying about the the art style. Well, it's an anime art style, but I think Sarah mm-hmm. Lynn is in, in is very much right that the way that he has these people express themselves. So I was just watching uh, Torturo, my neighbor Torturo, which mm-hmm. so much of the movie is two little girls, one one particular who's like four years old. Just expressing delight at stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> it's hilarious. And it's great. It's wonderful. Yes, it's wonderful. It, it really cuts through. It is also. So I made a point this time to only see subtitled version like that. You've never actually seen. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful that choice. You've never seen them. If you've only seen dubbed versions. This is a new topic, really. But like, I feel like you have not actually seen the work, right? Because. The part of what is weird about anime with the dubbing is that, like, that's not a normal expression for human beings to make when they say that, when they do that, that, that particular noise, but with English words. Mm-hmm. I agree. Like the lip syncing. Yeah. You lose something. You lose I want to hear them yell mommy or wait or whatever the thing mm-hmm. is in, yeah, with the expression as it was intended, not some English speaker, however famous an actor. Trying to sync up. I completely agree. But Christian Bale does such a good job. Uh, he was okay. <laughs> the dubs on okay. Miyazaki, especially later ones, are genuinely really good mm. because incredibly famous people want to do them. But in general, I think I've never met a Miyazaki film that I didn't have to watch more than once in order to understand what was going on. Agree. That's true. That will somewhat limit my ability to critique the boy in the harem, by the way. But I've taken it over the last week. I've gone into the habit of watching once with a dub and then with the subtitles the second time. And you pay more attention to try and pay more attention to the plot the first time and more attention to the actual movie the second. Did you hear that the original title of Boy and the Heron was How Do You Live? I can see why it would be called that. But why would they change it to the Boy and the Heron? How Do You Live makes actual perfect sense. Especially if this is his last movie. It's a reference to a book, I think, isn't it? I believe so. I just think that The Boy and the Heron is probably a little bit more marketable. Because kids going to see How Do You Live, they don't <laughs> want to see that shit. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to that. But The Boy and the Heron, oh, look, okay, let's go. It's a kid's movie. So I, I think it's probably a marketing thing. But yeah, I, I think that Al is on to something that watching Miyazaki films more than once even more than twice, it's kind of necessary to kind of really mm. get what that film is about. Listen, I love Miyazaki films a great deal. I, I appreciate the artistry, but God damn, these films are long oftentimes, right? Like they're uh-huh. like two hours mm-hmm. plus. And they seem longer than that. My daughter was saying they to do. me. It's not just a time. Yeah, they drag. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And so that is a real limitation for Getting into these films, it, it, it is a real challenge because you, not only are you sitting watching a two hour movie, but a two hour movie that drags in some places, right? And, and you really get a great deal of atmosphere. That's a nice way to say what I'm saying, right? With these films. And so that's the trade off. That is a trade off. Is that just because we're just impatient? It could be. It might be. And, but also I never really feel bad about drifting my attention, drifting off like the beginning of act three of a Miyazaki movie, because I feel like he doesn't really care if I'm actually paying my full <laughs> attention all the way through on it. I don't know if that's it's true. It's all there. so meticulously crafted. <laughs> I don't if know he if did, that's true. they just put more action in it. 
He's not so, so much about the action. So maybe we should talk about the boy in the hair and what did you guys think of it? And then what did you think of it as possibly his last full length feature? My hot take is, is nowhere near his best film, but it is the best of his films to be his last film. I think his, I think his last, mm, last film was a much better film, but this last film is a better last film. Mm. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> like you're talking me to a pretzel here. Like, like, what are you saying, Al? Explain to me what you're saying here. I was saying the last, last film he made. What, which what was, was the last, last, last film? The Wind Rises. Okay. Okay. Which at the time was his last film. Got it. Right. Is a better film than his last film, which is this film. That was probably my film. favorite of them. The Wind Rises. Yeah. I think mine too. That's your favorite? Your number one? Yeah. I, don't I think know so. I only that. saw it for the first time in the run up to this, but it was, it genuinely blew me away. And that one I did not fall asleep during. I was riveted because it was a, a wartime period drama. I didn't have time to see that one. Is that one also for adults? Is that he, one of his few? It's more for adults I than don't any think of the it's others. A kid's film. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It deals with a lot. It was gorgeous. But I think, so I think that one was a better film, but this one is like, so if it's going to be the last film he makes, it's a really good film to be the last film he makes. Basically, I, I think it deals with, it really neatly wraps up a lot of the themes that he's been playing with mm. his entire career, or at least addresses You're them right. like nothing ever gets wrapped up. But it really clearly, it, it's a really beautifully clear, like mission statement for his whole career. It's a lovely star to hang on the whole thing agreed i think that the film is beautifully animated for my taste it drags a little bit in certain places but that's to be expected with his films i agree that the wind rises is a better film but this is i think a wonderful kind of summation of his thoughts on like life and creativity and coming to terms with the world in the wake of violence. Like this is a wonderful kind of cap on all of the things that he's going to be. And this is a film that is almost certainly going to win an Oscar. It's, it's definitely going to win, going to beat Beyond the Spider-Verse, I think. Mark that down, although I could be wrong, but mark that down. Holler at me if you think I'm, if I'm wrong. But I think it's a really, really good film. I think it's a really well actualized film. I just wish it wasn't as long. Like it, it really mm-hmm. felt long. Like for some reason... This film, more than the other films that I've seen of his, seemed to really drag for me. Now, am, am I alone on that, Mark? Did it drag for you as well? I mean, no more so than the other ones. And it was kind of a, like, there probably was only about two minutes in there that I might have drifted off a little bit. And once I got back on <laughs> for the whole second half, but I really enjoyed the first half of the movie. Like, I like the contemplative, mundane, emotional setup stuff. It's more when the Heron started acting like an asshole and was <laughs> had this disgusting, like, yeah. weird cliche, big nose, Jewish stereotype, something, some oh. goblin-y, like, sticking out of his mouth. Like, when the character took that turn, I'm like, this is not the film that I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be a touching story about a boy who is lonely and he gets in touch with nature. No, oh no, it's spirited away too. It's another Alice in Wonderland <laughs> story where mm. you have this emotional foundation, but then he goes into another land and a lot of weird shit happens in nonlinear ways and trying to generate tension by, well, we got to get here, but don't make too much noise. And we got to get this thing over here. And it's hard for there to be a lot of stakes when it is so trippy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there, is he really going to get out? Is his, is he going to connect with his, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it, but his, uh, the time traveling mother or whatever. Right. It, it's funny. I sort of thought the opposite of you, Mark. I thought that the first half, and I enjoyed the first half, but the first half was really slow. It was set in a recognizable world. And then for the second half, two thirds, when he goes into that other world, I, felt like, oh, okay, good. I'm back here with Miyazaki and his weird stuff. And I don't know where this is going. And who are these parakeets? And why is a guy wearing a bird suit and all that stuff? And I was just kind of along for the ride. And then, but by the end, that whole message at the end had me in tears. And I sort of knew it was going there, even though I didn't know how it was going to get there. But I definitely really moved me by the end. I really, really enjoyed this movie a lot. 
and I'm just going to ask this question to you guys. Is this a spoilable movie? Are we really on the edge of our seat to try to figure out how this movie is going to end? Let's just announce right now. Yeah. Spoil whatever you want. <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I'm asking honestly, like, is it spoilable? Like it is, or is it more of the experience of going right. through life with this character and it just comes to an end? But like, it's not like what the parakeet king does. Like, do we really care? Like, is it a spoilable <laughs> movie? I couldn't tell you right now what the parakeet king does. I don't remember it well enough. How many times did you end up seeing it, Lawrence? Just once? Or did you get out? Why do you always put me on a blast? I saw it three times. Wow. I'm just what? saying you wow. have the cred that you actually let yourself experience it yeah. multiple times yeah. where I'm just has the fresh. I had to vote for it for my critic circle. So I had to vote on different things. So I always kind of try to get the full feeling. And as Al has already said, watching, if I were to watch this film like one time, I wouldn't get shit. I wouldn't understand anything. You got to watch it multiple times. The Parakeet King got mad. I can't quite remember why. <laughs> and he sliced some blocks in half or something like that. That's what he did. Yeah. So, yeah, I watched it multiple times. Man-eating parakeets with knives behind their backs. This sounds like a terrible movie, but I promise you it's a really good one. It's a really good <laughs> it's one. so funny. <laughs> Spoiler, the parakeets are cute after all. There you go. <laughs> Let's stop for an ad break. Are you interested in the parts of history that remain a mystery? Do you want to learn more about the historical myths and misconceptions used to prop up false beliefs today? The podcast Historical Blindness delves into all these topics, sharing puzzling tales from the past and examining hoaxes, conspiracy theories, and misremembered events that provide insight into modern politics and religion. Find out what's real and what's not when it comes to famous conspiracy claims like those surrounding the notorious assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and JFK and secret societies like the Illuminati. Discover astonishing parallels to modern politics and consider some of the most outlandish claims about religion. What can the false claim that AIDS was a U.S. bioweapon tell us about the COVID lab leak hypothesis? Why do some people claim that all religion can be traced back to ancient use of psychedelic mushrooms? Join host Nathaniel Lloyd as he attempts to shed some light on historical blind spots and fight the misinformation that permeates many people's historical worldview. Find and subscribe to Historical Blindness wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit historicalblindness.com. Check out newer episodes first, then go back and binge the back catalog. I think that the best thing that we can say to recommend this film is that when you are immersed in the storytelling and you're immersed in that world and you're immersed in an atmosphere, it's a wonderful like journey to kind of go mm -hmm. through. But the details of like, what's the motivation of the parrot King? What are they trying to do with these? Like what are the parrots trying to, it doesn't kind of matter. It's like the journey that you go through. That is the most important thing. And you walk out, deeply emotional from the mm -hmm. film, but not because of the machinations of the plot, but because of the atmosphere, because of what's happening around the plot. If that, if that makes any sense. Let's talk maybe about the emotions. I think it's a real shame, Sarah Lynn, you didn't see The Wind Rises, because one of the feelings I came away from this film with was, I, I came away with the sense that this film was kind of answering the questions which were raised by The Wind Rises. Interesting. That's an interesting take. But not, like, resolved. Because at, at the end of The Wind, so the, the Wind Rises is a story about... Spoilers for The Wind Rises. Spoilers, guys. Heads up. <laughs> I think maybe vibe spoilers for the ending, but not serious spoilers for the plot. It's about uh, guy designs, airplanes... And all he wants to do is design beautiful airplanes, and it's about how beautiful airplanes are to him. And But he's working for the Japanese government during the Second World War, so across the background of his quest to create beautiful airplanes is the fact that they're inevitably going to use, be used to commit war crimes. And it mm -hmm. makes the entire film feel incredibly eerie and weird. And then the end, the, res the resolution is... In or it, or the emotional resolution is in, it was not even a resolution. That's the point is it seems like in order to l look to create beauty in the world, you inevitably have to compromise. Mm -hmm. And it felt like this, if it, it felt like this movie to me was kind of find, finding a kind of resolution with those kinds of tensions between beauty and reality that, that Miyazaki looks at in, well, at least in that film and, and in a couple of others as well. And that was like the emotion that I came away with. It It felt like there was a lot of a big release of tension at the end. It felt like this was his way of saying, I know that I'm a big cynic and I think that 
feasible things inevitably get compromised, but I can find a way to live with that and that's better than the alternatives. Mm -hmm. It sounds like the resolution that he comes to at at the end of The Boy and the Heron too, except this is really Mm -hmm. a kid who is coming to the realization that, hey, if you want to be a part of the world, you have to understand that this is the way that it is, which is a really sad message to give to a child. But Miyazaki doesn't seem to shy away from sad messages to give to children. (laughs) Oh, no, he has no problem (laughs) wrecking the lives of children everywhere. He has no problem. Seems like a very sad man. But it was sort of beautiful, though, at the end. And it's also, in some ways, culturally specific. There's lots of things about being part of a community and that you have responsibilities as a kid that we don't necessarily push here in the West. But But the boy and the heron, by the end, like the fact that he gave up this fanciful world where he could be the king, he decides to give that up and join the real world and accept his circumstances. And we don't know. By the end, we just don't know if he's if that's a happily ever after or not. They sent him off to work in the coal mine. With that funny suit he was wearing. It seems like a really nice house. And the, the starting point is a very beautiful... What what he's coming back to is not seem horrible. With all the little old ladies. <laughs> it's very That was a weird addition. So that that's the Miyazaki art style <laughs> is mm-hmm. that like you have this very sort of realistic thing and then all these little old ladies that are animated as if they're literal trolls or something like it it was pretty jarring to me. Yeah, they come back and they all have I just accepted it. Big moles on their faces and noses and Gray hair. <laughs> They're not exactly glamorous. That's just what he does. But but really, I think that the best thing to happen to Miyazaki of the past few years is really HBO Max. Because all of his films were very hard to find in the U.S. for a while. I mean, you could find them if you were ser- searching them out. But to have mm-hmm. them on Max and readily available, like, I, I imagine that a lot of kids are exposed to him now. A lot of adults as well are exposed Mm. to him now because he's rarely available. Like, he's right there on Max, like, almost all his films. And so, for all the ups and downs of these streaming services, and this is a good thing now that you have access to. Al, do you guys have access to that over there in the UK? They're all on Netflix here. On Netflix, yeah. So, I mean, that's a good thing, you know, that you, you have access to him. And whether or not, I have some criticism. I mean, obviously I have some criticism. Like I said already, I really wish his films were not so laborious. It's just, I wish they weren't, but I'm happy. I'm happy they're there. Kiki's Delivery Service is the only one that I saw that I felt like was actually paced like a children's movie. That actual children would enjoy it. Whereas I feel like most children, I don't know exactly what the ages I have in mind, but like if you try to get them to sit through Spirited Away, maybe they would just be entranced on how crazy it is, and follow it all the way. Man, I don't know what it is. Kids love these movies, man. My daughter immediately loved all Mm. of his movies. Seriously, I I don't know what it is. Like, if I was a kid, I'd have been bored as hell. Man, I was watching Transformers or whatever, and He-Man and Thundercats, you know? Don't you think it's because he takes kids seriously? Maybe. Yeah. I think they feel seen. Yeah, even The Wind Rises, I know it's not actually that much of a, because it's about a boy starts as a boy dreaming mm-hmm. about planes and sort of it retains that. And there's a tragic romance in it, but the way that it's presented mm-hmm. is so G rated and kind of weirdly melodramatic. And like, it's not what you would just see in a Japanese or British, whatever high art value romance mm-hmm. tale. Mm-hmm. It, it it just seems. Yeah. I don't know if, what Al or Lawrence, what you guys thought of that aspect of that movie. It's fairy tale, right? So there's a lot that, like, the the Wind Rises is interesting because it not not only does it skate away from some of the more kind of gritty and realistic things about that kind of romance, but also, like, all of the war crimes. It just doesn't mention at all. It focuses intensely on its theme and its subject matter, which is something it got really heavily criticized for. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, I think it serves the film well that it leaves a lot of this stuff. I completely agree. I mm-hmm. completely agree. In the background. And the way he treats the wife in The Wind Rises is really interesting because she's a really ancillary character in a lot of ways. And her illness it mostly happens off screen. But it's used as a narrative device to like really to, to puncture kind of moments of the protagonist's 
journey and bring in a big bit of sadness when it's needed. And I wept like a baby. <laughs> but yeah, I think it comes back to just the, the, the point that Miyazaki's movies are very, very particular in style. They're not real. They're very dreamlike. Yeah. Even, even the one that's definitely, I think to my mind, definitely aimed at adults still has a lot of these dreamlike qualities that you'd associate with his, his children's movies. Cause I think that's just the way he makes movies. But I think the key word that you say there was, well, key words is two words, fairy tale. There was yeah. this movie that came out years ago called Pan's Labyrinth. You guys remember that movie, Pan's Labyrinth, right? That's exactly the kind of thinking that, like, that is visually sumptuous to me. Absolutely. And Pan's Labyrinth, it's a fairy tale. It's a dark fairy tale. It's scary in points, but it's a fairy tale. And I think that Miyazaki's films have a lot, have a lot of similarities with, like, that kind of filmmaking, where it's very magical realism. It's a fairy tale. It's more about the themes. It's not about getting the historical details absolutely right. That's not the point of the film. The point of the film is getting at these larger themes that he wants to tackle. And if you want to see a hard-hitting film about World War II, well, then watch whatever. Watch whatever you want to watch. Tour, 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 whatever. But if you want to get a, a film that gets at the themes that he wants to get at, that's what he's trying to do. And And I think that the criticism that, you know, that the wind rises God about not including certain kinds of things, that misses the whole point. That's not what he's trying to, to accomplish. He's trying to do certain kinds of things that you do in fairy tales. And I think that if you approach these films as you would C.S. Lewis books, or as you would Penn's Labyrinth, or as you would, oh gosh, what's that film with Johnny Depp and the Mad Hatter, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, Alice in Wonderland. yeah. If you approach it with that kind of mindset, You'll enjoy the film a great deal more, even though it drags a lot in many places. Yeah. Did we have anything specific to say about the relation of these films to that Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. sort of story? Like he definitely is running with that theme. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the, the history in Japanese l children's literature was. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I don't know what that history is. And then I don't know what he's playing with. I don't know that cultural context enough. But I imagine that the Japanese viewers who are watching that, they know it. Like, it, it jumps out to them. I just don't know what it is. I read something that, that said that he, he was very influenced by Western children's literature. So specifically mentioned Narnia and Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, because one of the questions I, I had for the podcast was whether, for, for the crew, for you guys, are we a crew now? We're a crew. Hey, guys, we're a crew. That's what's up. Let's go. And not even a motley one. A, yeah, a pretty respectable no. crew. Okay, go, go ahead, Al. <laughs> Sorry, Al. Go ahead. Which is why, or if there's a particular reason why Miyazaki is so popular in, or relatively so popular in the West, like, is there a reason why his movies are particularly approachable? And I wonder whether part of it might be because he is influenced. Because it's really, it's, what's interesting is it is super easy for us Westerners to look at a Miyazaki film and say, it's weird, but I guess that's just Japan. But what if the weirdness <laughs> or the, ki the kind the kind of we weirdness? Said, we didn't say that, Al. I, no, no, no. I, don't know I was that. saying a little bit of that. <laughs> well, we expect that of you, Mark. That's how you are. I thought the same thing, but a lot of the weird. But it, but Miyazaki is also very different from other anime. He is, and like his, his weirdness is slightly different. And I wonder whether a lot of the weirdness that we might want to ascribe to just being Japanese is actually traceable back to Miyazaki's influence from Western, like nonsense children's fairy tale or like the more, the uh, more kind of weirder fairy tale traditions. Cause there is a lot in there that's like Alice in Wonderland or that's like Narnia, the kind of stepping into the mm -hmm. other world and like fighting great battles between good and evil in that other world and returning out. I mean, that, that stuff is in, folklore generally too and clearly a lot of like the nature of the spirits and demons and what have you that that Miyazaki's characters end up in is brought directly from Japanese folklore but it's interesting to me the idea that perhaps he's kind of mirroring back to us some of our some of like western children's yeah. literature and maybe that's a reason why his work is more approachable than to, to western audiences than a lot of other uh, Japanese anime is I wonder if it's, if we put more emphasis on that, because that's how we like to understand stories. I was thinking about 
his storytelling techniques. And it's nothing that I've ever been taught. It's like, oh, you have to have a character with an arc. You have to have a plot. You have to have these beats. And his movies don't follow any of those rules. And we could say, oh, yeah, this is like Alice in Wonderland, or this is like whatever, Ariel and the Little Mermaid or something. But he doesn't use it like a skeleton as something that holds up his movies. It seems like what he does is he takes an inspiration from something like that and he completely changes it and makes it his own. I didn't go watch Ponyo because, oh, another movie about the Little Mermaid. Great. Like, look what a good job we did. Those are messages that I want my daughter to digest. And, and Ponyo was completely different. And the messages that you get from that movie are completely different. And the themes that it's exploring is completely different. And I really, really enjoyed that. I think that's what I went, I, I didn't go to see it because it was going to be parroting the same things that I've been hearing my entire life. Sarah, I'm getting a lot of Little Mermaid vibes from you. Like you mentioned it like four or five. <laughs> was that like a very important movie in your upbringing? <laughs> no. uh, did you watch no. it recently? Like you no, really the are saying version a lot of just, okay. It makes me cranky. The, the Disney version, the, the whole message like behind the Disney it version like makes me very cranky. 25.2 <laughs> times. Like you really mentioned the Little Mermaid. Like the, the thing that, okay, so getting back to Al, the thing that I think that Miyazaki does and this just could be me as a Westerner reading him, is that he takes the narrative framework of Western films that we are accustomed to, but he populates it with Japanese like archetypes and whatnot. So I think that part of the reason why he is so popular, Al, and you kind of already said this, I'm just kind of repeating you, but I'm going to put it in my critic talk, is that he takes the framework of the narratives that we are accustomed to, the fairy tale framework, that we are accustomed to, but he kind of populates it with Japanese like figures and demons and the stuff that they kind of are accustomed to. And I think that's the reason why he works both in the West and is so popular here, but also works in the East and is so popular there. And that is what I think is so rare about him, right? That he's able to kind of bring both of these things together in the same way that John Woo, in a very different way, he brings that Western action stuff, but he also keeps it very East and he brings it together. Those filmmakers who are able to do that are very rare. Typically, a person gets kind of set in one way, whereas these guys are able to kind of bridge the gap between the two, which is why I think that him being as old as he is and this possibly being his last film is really so tragic because we're kind of losing a master who is able to do both and and not just one or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that good critic talk? Did I do a good job? That was real good credit. So I also think it was you. quite Thank different you. from what I said. I thought it was an interesting, constructive addition to what I said, not just parroting at all. Thank you. I try to play off you, man. We work out well. So something else that's important to, to talk about is Miyazaki's influence on animation as a whole, and especially Western animation. He's clearly had a really liberating effect on what Western animation can do. Mm. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I was thinking about what rewatching his thoughts. I'm a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender, and it is clear... Very clear, very clear. Huge yes. amounts of the art style, Absolutely. and like even the basics of what they're trying to do wouldn't have happened without without Miyazaki's influence. And the film that Nimone was the film I was talking about, having seen recently. There's a terrific new animated film that came out on Netflix in on the Netflix, UK, yeah. and that also has like clearly draws enormously from Miyazaki's style. And is aimed directly at Western audiences. So this is just, this, this, the, it, it's su super interesting how, how like Miyazaki is like the clearly the Japanese filmmaker, but has in a lot of ways just created an entirely new way of doing animation, of approaching animation as film in the same way that, that like John Woo did for action. Completely agree. Weren't all the Pixar people, they were all incredibly influenced by Miyazaki. I can't remember where I heard that, but, but I think that, and who's the bat? There's somebody from Pixar who I think has been canceled relatively recently. John Lasseter, probably, probably John Lasseter. John Lasseter. Yeah, that's who it was. But I think he was someone who was really key on bringing, making sure that we knew who Miyazaki and his work, who he was at the time in the early aughts and, or maybe late nineties. 
Because wasn't Studio Ghibli, wasn't it also distributed or bought by Disney or something? Weren't they connected somehow? I mean, it, no, because it would be on the Disney Channel and not on HBO Max. Well, not anymore. No, I know. I think that the HBO Max thing has been, that was relatively recent. But I thought that had something to do with Pixar, bringing them over here so that they were more widely watched. But anyway, but it, you can really <clears> see, and, and actually in that documentary that I watched, he was, this was from 2016, and he was, at the time, he was making a short about a caterpillar, Boro the Caterpillar, and it was him incorporating CGI into, for the first time, into his animation And how fascinated he was with it and frustrated he was with it and how he was basically harassing these poor young animators into, well, that's not how a caterpillar moves. He would really show them you need to have, make sure that the bump goes higher and all of the hair on the animals and stuff like that, how it would move. And that kind of attention to detail is definitely something that you see in Pixar films. And I also think that his influence, like, notice how almost all his films have very strong female protagonists. And he's very intentional about that. And I think that that is something that was way ahead of its time when he first started kind of doing those kind of things. Now, we have kind of criticized his storytelling because it's very atmospheric. But when you get into the details of the story, it's very kind of clear what he's trying to do. Now, it it requires multiple viewings to get it all. So I think that, that Miyazaki's influence is kind of wide ranging. You can see it in Pixar. You can see it in Across the Spider-Verse, Into the Spider-Verse is there as well in some of the things that, that they're doing. I think Miyazaki is a very important filmmaker. And though I do have my criticisms and I do wish that some of the things are a little bit shorter or a little, a little, the narrative is a little bit tighter, I cannot overstate how important he is as a filmmaker and how his films kind of opened the door for people to kind of tell films, tell stories rather the way that they wanted to tell them instead of being mm-hmm. locked into a Disney formula of telling mm-hmm. those stories. Because of him, we get stories that are wide ranging, very different because of his influence. In our short remaining time, are there any specific things that we want to, maybe we can do more of this in the after talk, but about our our particular experiences with particular movies here. So Princess Mononoke, I'd never seen until this. And that's so different than Mm -hmm. the made for kid ones like Torture or Kiki that was epic. And there's some graphic violence and some very trippy, weird forest spirit creatures that jiggle their heads in disturbing ways. Yeah, there's so much. Any thoughts about that one in particular? I that that was sort of blew me away in a way unique in his catalog. Mm-hmm. It's a very unique film, but to be honest, that was my entry into this, and so oh. I was expecting his films to all be like that, and then to note to notice that the films are very different than that was a little <laughs> jarring for me. And so at first, I did not like Miyazaki. It took me a couple of years to warm up to him because that first film kind of set an expectation that was going to be. Not action. I don't know how to say it. It, it, Like more violent. Sure. Sure. More aimed at boys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not, you know, the most of his films are not aimed at boys. And so I really love that one. It took me a while to warm up to the rest of them, but honestly, my favorite of his films by far is Kiki's delivery service. I love that film. Oh, me too. It is an amazing film. And though Princess Mononoke was my entryway, that is the film that really kind of stuck with me. And it's, it's like I own a pirated Blu-ray copy that I'm not supposed to have because I love that movie so much. It, it, that is by far my favorite of his, of his movies. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, the first time I saw Princess Mononoke was just a couple of days ago. And it is so different. I can't imagine that movie as your entry point yeah, into point. Miyazaki. <laughs> that would just, that seems re- pretty <laughs> jarring. I can see why you would need a little bit of a break. <laughs> I think between that and Kiki, you do get a really good. I think those would be the two that I would suggest people to start with because you really get 
a thorough grounding in everything that Miyazaki is interested in Absolutely. between those Absolutely. two movies. Because right. really? so we haven't really talked about his take on nature and humanity's relationship to nature and the kind of like, views he espouses very clearly through a ham-fisted dialogue about how how people should that's that's not fair. I'm seeing it translated in one way or another. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's I'm sure it's I'm sure it's very subtle in the original. But yeah, you get that in Princess Mononoke and in Kiki you get the the other key thing in his movies, I think, which is especially which is like familial relationships in particular, and especially with women, although that's not the case in some of his movies. But it seems like I I think what Lawrence said earlier about these films being aimed at, at girls or being or at least focusing on, on the experience of young girls is an, maybe another reason why they're incredibly popular because there just aren't very many films aimed at children which are just about the experience of being a sister say in the way that mm-hmm. Totoro is or or like the experience of trying to find friends or fit in with a community from the perspective of a young girl like Kiki's delivery services mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I love that one because it's all about community Mm. And and these kids are, he doesn't shy away from traumatizing these kids. She moves away from her family so that she can go be the town witch, <laughs> basically, and how she's going to fit in there and how is she going to serve her community. And those are kind the kinds of messages that you don't get here because I don't think that as many of our movies here take kids that seriously, you know? Or that they're not as, that they're a lot smarter and a lot sharper than we think they are. Miyazaki, he reminds me of Doll, right? Where he, he tells kids, Ronald Doll, the author. Yeah, Roald, yeah. What? Did I say his name wrong? What yeah. is it? Roald Doll, not Ronald Doll. Ronald Doll, <laughs> God damn it. His brother Ronald, yeah. His brother okay. Ronald, <laughs> one of my best friends. Anyway, but he doesn't shy away from like telling scary stories to kids because he knows that kids can handle it. We've been on a journey of infantilizing kids. I don't know if that's the right word of like telling kids like stories that are very easy to digest and the good guys always win and it's very digestible and it's very easy and you walk away happy and every animated film these days, if you pay attention at the very end, it's like some kind of happy song that you walk out of the movie theater with this happy song. And he's not interested in that. Like he knows that kids, like kids in real life have to deal with real stuff. They have Mm -hmm. to deal with their parents getting divorced. They have to deal with, with wars. They have to deal with deaths in the family. And he takes kids seriously. And he talks to kids on their level. He doesn't talk down to them and he doesn't make everything wonderful because that's not how life is. And I appreciate that about and I yeah, wish that more filmmakers, more storytellers would follow that that genre and that kind of mold and tell kids hard stories and don't always end on a positive note. Sometimes life ends on an ambiguous one. I think that's okay. Hmm. But it's also interesting that he also he never punishes optimism or like youth. No, child, he, doesn't. he doesn't punish he doesn't. childishness. Not at right. all. Not at all. He throws all of these horrible things at the, at these children and they go through all these traumatic experiences, but they all, they're always ultimately relentlessly positive characters. Mm-hmm. And his films, never thought of this before, but it's super interesting. His films always end with, as you say, Lawrence, kind of ambiguous emotional note, like something beautiful's happened, but something sad's happened too. But the characters at the center of the story always remain positive the entire way through. And they're never punished for that positivity. Like the lesson is never you need to be more cynical. It's the world is awful, but you should remain optimistic anyway. Mm-hmm. And go be a witch. If you want to be a witch, <laughs> go be a witch. Go be a witch. God damn it. I was trying to think of how he treats his villains, like in Kiki in particular, mm-hmm. like there's some kind of a little, some light bullying, some snobby, ungrateful people, but mm-hmm. it just turns out like, well, they don't get the the benefits and the praise that your heroes get. It's not that they get some comeuppance. It's not that they turn around. It's it's merely, let's just ignore the, the bad. And I don't know if that's just because mm-hmm. it's a kid's movie as opposed to Princess Mononoke where, yeah, yeah, bad guys do get killed 
I would have to survey the films to see. see how, but I always think that's an interesting tack that on is interesting. children's movies of how they treat the villains. Like, do the villains have to just, oh, I, I realized I was being obnoxious and now I like you. Like, that's the sort of the most kid-friendly way to do it. But mm-hmm. it is like in Spirited Away, you've got no face who literally ingests people. But at the by the end, everyone seems to have been at peace with <laughs> no face. And it didn't seem like there was any sort of, you're right, Mark, like there's no, oh, now I'm sorry, or I'm going to pay for my crimes or. Or kill no face. Did they kill yeah, no face? Or kill or get <laughs> killed or something. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing like that. Can you kill no face? I don't know. If you can't kill no face. And, and I think that's, that's really important because the, a lot of the time the villains, like the villains in Miyazaki's work are just the, like the, just the way that the world is or the yeah, way he presents exactly. the world as being, yeah. which is yeah. a thing that the heroes have to navigate in order to come to terms with whatever. But no face is a great example because no face doesn't exist to be beaten. No face exists to be accommodated to be dealt with. Yeah. It's the same as the lesson in Princess Mononoke, right? You feel that, that nature is scary and threatening, but the way to handle that as people isn't to try and conquer it. It's to live your life in such a way that you can accommodate it. Well, that sounds like a good thing to wrap up on. Any final words? <laughs> I mean, I think this is a strong recommendation. Yeah, go watch his films. Yeah. Of course. I think Al had the best idea there. Go watch. I mean, The Boy in the Heron, sure, it's everywhere right now, but Kiki... But the wind rises... Well, Kiki and The Princess One and Okay, I think those are good entry points. And then, of course, after that, I would say The Totoro. Wind Rises. I would think I would Totoro would be well, yeah. And Wind Spirit Rises. Away, well, I just... God damn it. We can't agree on shit. Like, we can't agree on anything. Favorite. The That's biggest favorite. grossing <laughs> Japanese movie, period, or something. Boy in the Heron, yeah. It's made a lot of money. I was talking about Spirit Away. Spirit Away. Spirit Away, oh, Spirit Spirit away. away. yeah. Spirit Away. That's such a great, Boy in the Heron's That's a great gonna... movie. Beats well, it, I'm going to say, God damn it, go watch Kiki and go watch The <laughs> Princess right. Mononoke and I'm done. <laughs> go watch all of them. Go to the Miyazaki Film Festival you can in your watch local all of them community if you want to. You can check that's, in that's with me in six journey. months that's a long <laughs> if I've watched any other of his movies. Or if I You're just not going to watch any more. I'm going to go watch The Wind Rises. Turn it on and go to sleep to it. Sure. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Peace. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.